welcome to the show. All right now. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. You know, symbolically, as a basis, okay. we are sort of uh, planted on the root, right? Right. <laughs> and that's why you are symbolically in front of one of the biggest trees here. Uh, where we are. Okay. Tell us a little bit about yourself for those that are not aware of you. How did you get your start in the music industry? Okay. Well, I grew up in Baltimore and I grew up around a lot of other bass players, really good bass players, uh -huh. like Gary Granger. And oh, yeah. The Skeet and all those guys, you know, uh, just listening to them, Tony Bunn, and I decided I was going to play bass. So I saved up some money, bought the bass. It was really a piece of crap. Uh huh. But it was mine. Okay, okay. And I stayed in my bedroom and just practiced, practiced, practiced. My mother, I didn't know she was paying attention. Uh -huh. One day she said, come on, let's go. We're going to go for a ride. And I'm like, okay. She took me to the music store uh -huh. and bought me a brand new bass. Nice. It was like 175 bucks, And that was a lot of money, <laughs> man. It yes. was a brand new Fender. Yes, yes. And she bought it for me. And then I just kept practicing and working. And then eventually... I found out about these programs from Baltimore, but there's a school. I met a piano player. Mm -hmm. She was a jazz. She is a jazz pianist, Liz Beckman. Okay. Seriously, could play. Nice. She could play a better bass line in her left hand. Oh yeah, I know some players like that. Yeah. So then she said, "You ought to go to you ought to go to a uh, 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 Skidmore." And okay. I'm like, "What is Skidmore?" So Skidmore, the Skidmore Jazz Institute, uh -huh. is up in New York. Okay. So almost like every summer for a couple years, I would go. Right. And what it is, it's a three week, it was three weeks. Okay. Where you on campus and you got all the big boys teaching you. And I was blessed to have Rufus Reed mm -hmm. and Milt Hinton. Yeah. Which we got to be real close as like my teachers. Okay. So I just learned so much. I learned more from Milt. Okay. About playing bass <clears throat> and about life mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. than I did when I went to school. What could afterwards. you say in particular you could pull from, from Milt, you know, as far as lessons on the bass? Well, one of the things that he said was nobody chooses the instrument. The instrument chooses you. Very true. So basically, he said when you play an instrument, it tells a lot about your personality. Ah. And whether it fits... Or whether it's good or bad is another story. Okay. Like, say, I can listen to a bass player, and I can tell you if this guy's got jokes off the record, if he likes to laugh. <laughs> I can tell you That's if he's crazy. nervous. That's crazy. I can tell you if, if he's playing electric. I can tell you whether or not he can play upright. Mm -hmm. I can tell you whether he's searching uh -huh. or trying to, you know, keep his head above water, or if he's relaxed or super intelligent, all of that stuff comes out in the music. Yes, it And that does. was one of the things I learned from Milk, because once I really, really got to know him, he got that nickname, Judge, uh -huh. because of a big tone mm -hmm. and serving the music. And okay. the one thing he told me was always serve the music, do your job. Right. You know, it's not about playing a million notes or fast and loud. He says it's about doing your job. Mm -hmm. Hinton, and can you dive in a little bit more about that in the well, recordings aspect of it? Recordings. At one point, he was the most recorded jazz bassist mm -hmm. around, and he played bass up until he was 90 years old. Yeah. And what I learned was to have a big tone. It's not about playing a lot of notes. Just service the music, do your job. Okay. That's it. Okay. That's, it's, it's, it's easier to say than it is to do. Right. But that's where I try to stay. Okay. You know, not playing a lot of notes, just identify the groove. And one thing he told me that always stick with me. Uh -huh. He said, when you practice, if you pick up your bass and you play something that you already know how to play, mm -hmm. he said, after you get done, reach in your pocket, take a quarter out, put it in your other hand, okay. and now put it in your other pocket and pay yourself. Wow. Because you just you just entertain yourself and you might as well get paid. Okay. So what he told me was before you pick your bass up, already think about what you want to try to work on. Uh-huh. And then do it. And then whether you finish it, complete it, but you still got better at it. And that's, that's better than picking up the bass and just da 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 and then put it down. He said, just pay yourself. You do so that. the so the paying is sort of like positive reinforcement. 
No, the paying is because you really just entertained yourself. You didn't you didn't practice. Okay. You did you, you know, you didn't move forward. Mm -hmm. You played something you already know how to do. Mm -hmm. So say you sit back and you say, Well, I want to work through this diminish. I want to learn more about how diminished chords work over dominant chords. Then you sit there and you think about it and you work on it. And at the end of the time, you've gotten a little bit better because before you started, you didn't know that. Right. But if you just pick up the baseline, pick up the bass and play a baseline that you already know, what have you gained? Nothing. Mm. So Good. other words, he was saying, every time you pick your bass up, before you pick it up, think about what you want to work on okay. so you can get better at it. Awesome. Now, you mentioned um, in your um, thought a, a couple of uh, uh, great players other than Hinton. You mentioned Rufus Reed. I like a lot of the things that he's done. He's an amazing author, and I believe he has a book uh, among many of them. One of them is The Evolving Basis. Mm -hmm. um, now, you yourself are an amazing author as well, and I um, have had the opportunity to look at, at some of your latest work. I know you've got a few things and maybe there's some more things coming out. Mm -hmm. But um, I would say the one that uh, people have really been talking about is the book, uh, the, the Basics. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about that from your perspective. In okay. other words, if I, if I were to tell you sort of what I took away, some of the main things was, okay. well, this is a great tool, not only for somebody just starting because it takes us through the steps of theory and intervals and so forth and some practical things but it goes a little bit deeper and it gives a, a viewpoint of some of the, the greatest players that are out there uh, um, not only as bassists but there's some great drummers like Dennis Chambers yeah. and um, me being a bassist and a drummer definitely like his okay. uh, uh, viewpoint on it and some of the things I got from him was like how to apply polyrhythms mm -hmm. and and really what I like to do is transfer that to the bass and back but on that note this new book and I know you've got some new stuff coming out how would you sum it up the first book what I did Dante was I thought about all of the bass players, or most of the bass players that I really like, so I decided I'd come up with a collage mm -hmm. and put their names on the cover of the book. Right. Got permission, hey, you want, you know, they like, sure, do it. So what I did, I tried to bring together as much positive energy as I can. Mm -hmm. So not only when you look at the cover of the book. And let's, do you mind to put that in front of the camera just for a second? When you look at the cover. Okay. Closely. Basic theory. You see different names mm -hmm. and these are all bass players that i know personally and that you know been around and we learn from each other mm -hmm. because that was another thing that milt hinton taught me was that bass players are supposed to be like brothers sure it's sure it's not like i'm better than you or you better it's none of that mm -hmm. forget about it mm -hmm. share mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. so i got the idea i put all the bass players on it and then i somehow i came up with the idea about a coffee mug because yes. I figured most of us drink coffee. Yes. So I got the coffee mug that has the same names on it. So I said, I'm going to send you a coffee mug, bro, and then uh, take a picture with it and, 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 and drop some wisdom. Tell me what you think. Give me your favorite quote, and I'll find a place to put it in the book. So everybody, they did it. And because it was so much positive, it was truth, positive energy, it just got stronger and stronger. Okay. And the book sold a whole lot more than I thought, but it was based off of just truth and positivity. Uh -huh. And then I get a lot of feedback from folks saying that they also feel some spiritual overtones okay. in the book. Not okay. religious, but mm -hmm. spiritual. It's mm -hmm. just more like being a good person. Right. Just, you know, different things like that. And then the one thing that kind of evolved itself was Leroy. Okay. Now, Leroy is a fictitious guy. Everybody knows Leroy. Right. Leroy is, he can play any instrument. Leroy is the cat that show up on the gig. He might show up a little late. Uh-oh. He might get the dates confused. He might get the location confused. He might not have all his equipment. He might not even be dressed the way you told him. But once he plug in, uh -oh. he can play. He gonna kill it. He gonna kill it. <laughs> he gonna kill we it. We know some of those Leroy's Everybody out Everybody know there. Leroy. Everybody yes, know Leroy. Yes, yes. So, Leroy was introduced in the first book. Okay. 
And then it got to the point where I had to write a second one. And Leroy is featured in the second book, Out of Control. He's okay. out of control. Okay. okay. So the first one will make you laugh in some spots. And there's a lot of personal stories in there between bass players and musicians. And they know what happened. And so we get a little bit of this. But the second one is just all Leroy out of control. And he's the type of cat that when you ask him a musical question, you got three options. Okay. Either he's going to tell you exactly what you need to hear. Mm -hmm. And you'll be like, okay. Or... He's going to tell you something that may make you think a little bit and figure out what he's talking about. Or his answer is going to make you wish you had never talked to him at all. Okay. So in that, car, in that book, the second book, which is volume two, okay. is based off of Leroy. Okay. Now, is volume two out yet? Volume two just came out. Just came out. Yeah. Okay. So everybody and listening can go pick up volume one and volume two if you haven't gotten volume one already. And volume two... The same concept, except all of the names here are bass players from Detroit. Gotcha. Detroit. Okay. So we call it Detroit Edition. Ah. So therefore, it's their pictures and their thoughts, and it's some really heavy, heavy, heavy hitters yeah. from Detroit okay, okay. that we know. And, yeah, and yeah, so yeah. this is like their book. Right. You know, and on the back, you see the pictures of all the guys with the coffee mugs and right. everything like that. But over and over, overall, it's a good tool, just like you said. Mm -hmm for a bass player at any level or for a teacher mm -hmm. that wants to use it for students because everything's laid out, mm -hmm. you know. Awesome. Yeah. Well, what I particularly liked about your marketing aspect of really re how you got a lot of people involved, and as you said, it is a, a community, a rhythmic community, yeah. a bass community, um, and then on the subject of Leroy's, yes, we all know some of them, <laughs> and I know some Leroy's that play piano. <laughs> it doesn't matter. You're right. And, and they're not too far from where we are right now, and they have they have braids, they have some corn rolls. Well, I'm not okay. gonna mention names, okay. but I know I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay, so Baltimore, man, I've done some gigs in that area in D.C. and uh, uh, the Channel Inn in, in Washington D.C. Uh, done some stuff in that general area, and something sort of comes to memory. Um, I once was on the road and I broke uh, the bass that I had, the neck broke, and I had to grab, um, I, I liked the electronics of it, so I didn't want to get a new axe, just wanted to find out where can I get a fretless neck. And it was a place called Venom and Music. Okay. I, I believe it was somewhere in the suburbs. It's like Rock, Rockville. Or Rockville, like Pike, yeah. Maryland. Yeah. yeah, something like that. How far were you sort of from from that area and 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 what do you what can you tell me about that general about area 35 minutes or okay, something like okay, that and okay okay so the baltimore washington area tons of musicians yeah, good yeah, musicians yeah. i mean so that's probably the best place for that music store to be uh -huh. and they they got a lot of public traffic coming through there a lot of traffic so i'm sure they hooked you up yeah 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 i, I they took care of me okay that was cool what are you working on these days other than the books tell us about some of the musical projects you're working on any recording and i know you've got some wonderful uh residencies and you've got students tell us a little bit about that well for the last 23 years mm -hmm. i've been teaching students at uh, la jolla music studio okay which is pretty good it's some really good and i don't even like to say teach i like to say share okay i've been sharing information with bass players at la jolla for about 23 years and also, when Anthology was around, mm -hmm. that was a really good venue. We did hundreds of shows for seven years straight. Okay. So a lot of cats came through there, got to meet a lot of cats there. And then I put together this group called Flex. Flex? Flex. Okay. So I took the best bass players that I shared information with, helped them out with a few standards, and then hired the best rhythm section cats I could find. Okay. So give these brand new bass players a chance to play with the big boys. Mm -hmm. They may only do a couple tunes or one set, but while they're on that gig, they're the leader of the band. They right. call the tunes, they call the tempos, they call everything. So right. so they, they get comfortable and, and then obviously the rhythm section guys know. So they just stay patient and they're like, okay, I see. You know, so and the reason it's called flex is because it could be a trio, it could be a 10-piece Motown band, it, whatever, you know. 
And so that's my way of helping out and getting the new bass players out and running. And then there's uh, Negociant Winery, okay, which is a really nice place. The owners, great people. Uh, we do a thing there every Thursday. It's the house band. Negociant so Winery. Negociant Winery. Okay, in San Diego. 1263 University okay. Avenue. Okay. And I try to have different special guests come in every week to sit in with the house band. Mm -hmm. And uh, you'll get a night. <laughs> oh, I appreciate that. <laughs> appreciate that. What's up? But that's just what we do, man. Okay. We have to share in order to grow. Continue well, that's, to grow. That is a wonderful venue, a, a great uh, selection. And uh, I know a lot of people will definitely want to take advantage of that. They have a chance to, to see this and come down there. Do you do other um, residencies or is that the main one right now? That's the main one. There's a couple of uh, breweries and wineries in La Mesa, stuff mm -hmm. like that, that we do. But those are primarily the flex gigs. So I book the gigs for flex and they get out and get a chance to play and, you know, do their thing. And other than the, those two residencies and the teaching, I got my hands full, man. Gotcha. Got my hands full. During the pandemic, you know, I like to know, and a lot of people like to know what people sort of did when you couldn't play out. Now, let me, let me contrast that. Um, one of my favorite guitar players is Mike Stern. And, um, you know, of course, he does a lot of stuff with Dennis Chambers, but Mike Stern has decided to sort of do more of a residency thing post-pandemic. Uh, now, that could just be because of supply and demand uh, of getting, you know, back around the world the way he used to be, or just at this stage of life, the game, say, you know what, I'm just going to stay in New York City at the 55 grand. So how do you feel about that? In other words, opportunities to go back on the road versus doing sort of what you're doing now. Where do you sit with that? I, I would rather not go on the road. Okay. I try to avoid it as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And I like to stay home. Right. You know, I like to stay home. During the pandemic, I did most of my lessons on Skype or the other thing. Was it called Zoom or uh -huh. whoever? Uh -huh. That was it. And did a whole lot of practicing. A uh -huh. lot of practicing. Sometimes, Dante, I would practice eight hours a day. Yeah. Eight hours. Like, like back when you, we were younger, right? <laughs> Except it had a little more focus because the one thing I do, when I, if I'm going to practice eight hours, I'll break it down. An hour of sight reading, an hour of soloing, an hour of walking bass, and I got these little timers that I use. Mm -hmm. So I'll click it over and, okay, I got one that is three minutes, five minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, in an hour. Okay. They all little hourglasses with the sand. Mm -hmm. So I might pull out a piece of music. It could be a saxophone chart. It could be anything. Okay. And I'll put it in front of me and put it on the stand. And I'll take the three minutes. Boom. I say, you got three minutes to learn how to read that. Da -da 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 -da. Okay. And then keep it moving. Okay. <laughs> keep it moving. You okay. know, so it's just one of those things that just to practice. That, you know? that is a very practical exercise yeah. to do something. Three like minutes, that. five minutes, half an hour working on or changes or analysis or anything like that with skill. So, I mean, that's what I do. Okay. Yeah, that's it. Wonderful. When you're on the stage and you are, let's say, comping a soloist, let's say it is a, uh, a flautist mm -hmm. in particular, something that's a little bit lighter on top, what goes through your mind strategically as far as how to make that scenario work better as opposed to you know, a full horn section or a quintet where you've got trumpet and tenor? Well, for me, I just play as light. I would play as light as possible and there's less that I need. The least amount of notes I need to play, that's what I'll do mm -hmm. to make it work. Okay. And that's just respecting the music. You know, sure. to respect the music. If it's busy, then I'm going to do the opposite and just support so I can, you know, make this person sound good. You got some musicians that know how to make others sound good. And just to throw another name out there, uh -huh, there's uh -huh. a piano player, Kamal. Oh yeah, yeah. He knows how to make everybody sound good. The way he plays the chords, it kind of just surrounds you and it's like, damn, we sound good. You know, but it's a lot of what, what he does, his approach. Uh -huh. You know, I was blessed to play with him quite a few times years ago and, and I noticed the difference. Okay. You know, so that's what you do, man. Just respect the music. Yes, respect yeah. the music. Make it sound better. Make it sound better. Make it's it sound not better. about me. Mm -hmm. It's never about me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you ask me to take a solo, then it could be about me for a couple seconds. Mm -hmm. But then right after that, it's back to doing the job. Doing exactly. The job. Exactly. That's it. There's a lot of bass players that just play. Yeah. And that's all they do is play. You can't tell when somebody else is soloing or 
or it's the bridge or the chain they because they because it you know that's where they are sure and i've is. had that i've had that player just to sort of emphasize what you're saying um as a band leader myself with my quintet and when i've had some younger players um not really i mean just act really brilliant but not really knowing okay your solo's over you're you're going over the bar you know mm -hmm, what i mean mm -hmm. and um would you say that that sort of comes with maturity to know, okay, here's my time, now let me support? I mean, does that come with maturity, or why do you think some people get that, even at a young age, and some don't? I think it's just about life experience. I think some folks are not even aware that they're not aware. Mm. They just play. Mm -hmm. And it, I don't think it's about maturity. I think it's about uh, some wisdom. Just, you know, you, you just get a break. You get a blessing. You get you just... You hear it one mm -hmm. day it's like wow you know it, it depends on how open yeah a person is because the one thing you and i both know if a person a musician does not sound really good nobody will tell them right they won't tell them. they won't say anything but if you if you sound really good they'll tell you but if you've got things you need to work on they won't they won't tell you you know because maybe it's a fear of losing a gig or embarrassing but some people never get it meaning in other words let's say it's your band and you've got somebody some young player they may be great but they're doing this that and the other that you would rather they don't do are you saying that the yourself or the average person in that position wouldn't say hey don't do that well they just don't call you is it you know they, they won't call you okay but if it was in my band i would say it i would say let's try it this way mm -hmm. let's try this mm -hmm. Can you help me with this? Okay. Uh, can you do this? Okay. And I put the information out like that. Got so it. So that way, they it's, can get it's, the, it's encouraging yeah, a little bit. Yeah. I wouldn't slam. I wouldn't slam. Yeah. A person, you know, because that's not cool. Sure. But uh, I would, I would find the best way to get the information out, and that would tell me if this person is open, mm -hmm. whether they're listening, or can they really hear what you're saying? You know, because you know, like today, I had a lesson today where. The person I was sharing the information with, he beat me to the punch. I had prepared for him to listen to a tune with Dave Holland playing bass. Okay. And I wanted him to hear how Dave Holland played these really big notes, really nice notes. So I gave him a tune to play, and that was the exact approach that he used. Ah. And I said, man, you just destroyed my whole lesson. <laughs> <laughs> I said, because listen to the tune. And I said, you just did what I was already, you know, and he did it naturally. Mm -hmm. And then we listened to it. And then this big smile came out. And he's like, I said, see, that's who you sound like. He mm -hmm. sounds similar to Dave Holland. Ah. So I'm putting the big notes out and it just warm around, not playing a lot, using sequences. Okay. I remember Herbie Hancock said sequences, two, good. Three at the most, that's it. Okay. When you play a sequence, when you play a line, mm -hmm. you know, the sequence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, he just destroyed my whole lesson. We had a good time, and we just, you know, just dug on more and more and more. But at the end of the lesson, he had the big old smile on his face. Okay, that's like, smiling. He's smiling. Like the Cheshire Cat, right? Yeah, he's smiling. I said, yeah. <laughs> so one of my buddies said, they helped me write this book. Well, give me the inspiration to write it. He said, Tone, how do you keep... Your students he said folks take one or two lessons with me and they never come back okay I said I don't have their problem I said they take one or two lessons with me and they never leave and he said so I said you can use this book and it'll help you you know because you can put the information out there and make sure they get it and you can put it out piece by piece and then just watch them grow mm -hmm. and you know it's not it's not about trying to show somebody everything you know because that's not how it works in life mm -hmm. can't do that you know so i don't know dante cool, i mean cool. we do what we do man we do what we do. we do what we do you know um one of my um mentors the skipper henry franklin you know recently mm -hmm. uh came on the show and i asked him this question i'm gonna ask you the same question what would you say about an experience you've had where things were not going right 
and how did you deal with it? Okay. <laughs> Let me think which one I want to talk about right okay. now. <laughs> it's, it's a couple of them, right? <laughs> yeah, let's see. I remember in D.C., mm -hmm. I, I won't mention any names, but there was a drummer. Yeah. Female woman. Yeah. Really, really nice drummer. Okay. And we did some union gigs together. Mm-hmm. And we always, we had the, what they call the green sheet gigs, where you do like, you get like five gigs for the summer. Okay. You get five. So the four of us, we put all our gigs together. So mm -hmm. we had like 20 gigs amongst us. So on one of the gigs, we couldn't find a drummer. And so we called her yeah. since she was in the union. And I know some of you guys know who I'm talking about. But anyway, <laughs> she said, Tony, rehearsal's at my house, this, 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 this. So I go to rehearsal all happy and everything like that and to get there she put these charts in front of me she got behind the drums and went to count it off da, 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 da. and i'm reading it i'm like uh. and i couldn't read what she wrote yeah yeah she said she stopped she said that's not what i wrote tone uh -oh. she said play what i wrote she had it written so even though the courts were there you needed to play what she wrote specifically that play the specifically. figure specifically okay so i tried it again she stopped the drums she got up she came over, she said, let me see your bass. She took my bass and she, mm -mm -mm. she said, this is what I wrote, Tone. I'm like, damn. Ouch. 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 <laughs> so I wanted to go home. I wanted Ouch. to go home right on the spot. But see, those are the things that had me sit down and start working on reading. Start okay. working on everything. Okay. Because what I always say, a situation like you just mentioned, mm -hmm. It's really going to help you. No matter how it turns out, it's yeah. going to help you because it gives you an opportunity to be better. Uh, so those situations, and I can name quite a few, and I even mentioned a couple in the book. It's funny, but it wasn't funny then. But anytime something like that happens to you, it's really to help you. That it's is really the wake-up call. Yeah, it's, okay. it's to help you. This is what I should focus on. This, now, right. you earlier had alluded to some of your practice time divided into sight reading as opposed to let's say a walking baseline pattern and you said you mentioned picking up a sax chart for say so i was going to ask you what do you do when you run out of things to sight read you're only ha only going to have so much stuff laying around your house or you may only have so many files on your ipad you're picking up horn lines to sort of pick up the slack right is that I, what you're doing i can't run out i mean <laughs> i took a two-year period where i only studied cannonball adley okay so how he approached mm -hmm. so i learned a lot of licks the cannonball play like what he would play if he see this two five or whatever and it's like because it, it just really got my attention okay so i took two years and just studied cannonball for two years you know sax lines okay. just it's just i would never run out I, my weakness dante is books and i got bookshelves and bookshelves of books you have a plethora of material to pull from. man i got books Amen. I got books. Amen. Amen yeah. to that. Um, as a bassist, as a band leader, Tony, what do you look for in a drummer? Well, because we I, know that marriage of bass and drums, right? Uh -huh. What do I'll you look for? Tell you what, if the drummer uses drumsticks all night, that's not somebody that's going to be on a gig with me. Okay. I like to hear brushes. I like the bamboo. Mm hmm. I like the other little, whatever the little toys they use, everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They got to be able to do it all because I don't personally want to hear somebody beating all night. Like the cat, well, all of the cats that they had in Yellow Jackets, mm -hmm. those guys play. Yeah. And you don't hear them beating, 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 you know. I mean, you hear, you hear stuff. Right. You know, you hear stuff. So when I hear guys like Dennis or Greg Granger, any of those guys, they play. Okay. And they'll pick up other things. And I mean, it's just so I want to hear different textures. Okay. I just don't want to hear sticks banging all night because my patience will get short. Okay. You okay. Know? And it's like, come on, man, help me out. All right. All you right. <laughs> all right. I appreciate that. And um, I feel better now because in my stick bag, I'm going to have some monster sticks. I'm going to have some rods. I'm going to have some go. brushes. That's right. I'm going to have two types of brushes. Some are plastic, some are steel. Right. You know what I mean? And a few different types of sticks. So, okay, good. There Wonderful. You go. Wonderful. Let me ask you this then. Um, what would you say to a young student that is sort of coming up? Which and let, let, let's, let's flip the script. Let's okay. say it's not a bassist because sometimes a piano player might take a lesson from a bass player. Mm -hmm. 
let's say a horn player, because there's kind of a marriage between sax and bass too. Let's say a horn player takes a bass lesson from you. What would you say to them as far as how to be better at what they do and just in general as a musician, universally? Well, I would ask them, first of all, why are you playing sax? Mm -hmm. What is it you like about sax? You know, who do you like to listen to? Why? Because then it all comes down to tone and choice of notes. Mm -hmm. That's why we like anybody. Okay. Tone and choice of notes. And if they don't come up with those answers, I'll give them and suggest that these are the reasons why. And then we will pay attention to tone. Okay. We listen to different tones. Okay. We say, well, how does he make this tone? Why does he make this tone? What does this tone make you feel like? You know, so it's a whole bunch of, it's a lot of little things that, that I would, you know, would dig into. And like you said, it could be a piano player. I'd ask the same questions, you know, who do you like? You know, I can remember playing on a gig with Carl Evans. You remember Carl? He was, he was here in San Diego. Okay. Carl, okay. the group Fat Burger. Uh, oh, the late Carl. Carl Evans, Gotcha, yeah. okay, okay. And we went to a gig, Dante, and did a sound check. And when we did the sound check, we forgot to stop playing. We played from sound check all the way through the gig. Wow. We had that much fun. That's crazy. Completely forgot. Wow. We just, I would name any, I could name any piano player and say, okay, how about Herbie? And he'll take a solo, sound just like Her Herbie. I'll say, well, okay, Bill Evans. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at like, damn, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, that's, and so just learning from somebody like that also, mm -hmm. you know, that was versatile and understands, okay. you know, so that's what. You would advise. I the, would uh, advise them, you okay. know. What do you know? You okay. know, why do you know it? How did you know it? Mm -hmm. Are you sure? Mm -hmm. You know, that kind of thing. And then you just open up that, that can. And then when they leave the lesson, I like to tell anyone, if we sit down for a bass lesson, at the end of the lesson, you only have three options. One, give me one more chance, man. I know the lessons, I know, but let me try it again. That's one. Two, I don't have it, but I understand it. But when I see you next time, I'll have it. Or three, you leave with a big smile because you high musically high because you got it mm -hmm. the fourth one when i had a, a person that was frustrated and left and they even told someone else that well i didn't like the lesson because he asked me stuff that i already know i said well if he asked you stuff that you already knew maybe you should have explained it and then they would because for me i think it works like this if I ask you this leading up to this and you can't tell me this, now we got to go back down to this and work our way back up. Because you should at least be able to at least rattle it off right, and right, then move on. Right. And when this person couldn't do that, I said, the only, you only have those three options that I mentioned. If you don't have one of those three options or feelings, mm -hmm. after the lesson, you have to find another teacher. Okay. You have to find somebody else. Okay. You know, and, and it was fair and... She's still there. It's five years later. Still there. Okay. Matter of fact, just about ready. To, I helped her with her uh, getting ready to get accepted to Berkeley. Mm -hmm. She's going to be going to Berkeley. So I've done my job. Ah. <laughs> I've done my job. Awesome. Awesome. I, I know how that feels. Yeah. I've had students that have gone on to MI and whatnot. Say, okay, well, I'm mm -hmm. done. Tony, we really appreciate your words of okay. wisdom, your, your story. Uh, we want to shine a light again on your, your wonderful work, the books that you've authored. Uh, uh, we definitely hope um, everybody will go out and, and, and pick those up. So we get Amazon, oh. Barnes and Nobles, oh. Walmart, or just get it from me. Okay. There you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Tony, blessings and yes, thank sir. you for coming today. All right. Thank you. Thank you.